now that we've learned about sampling variability, understand its role in the research process, and we've learned the mathematical tools that let us deal with it using information from single samples from larger populations, we're going to start getting into the really exciting stuff where we compare populations on some measure vis-a-vis -vis comparing random samples from those populations. And to start, we're going to introduce this whole idea of hypothesis testing through something called the paired t-test. What we're going to get into in this set of lectures is comparing two groups based on their means, the paired data situation, and we're going to use this as a springboard to introduce the idea of statistical hypothesis testing and define what are called the null and alternative hypotheses. And we'll talk about the relationships between confidence intervals and hypothesis testing when comparing means. And we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about something called a p-value, defining it, how to compute it, what it can tell you, what it can't tell you, and other good stuff. So let's get this started. And I'm going to talk about the paired t-test. And one component to it is a confidence interval, something you're already familiar with. So we'll go in in that direction and set up the idea. So one thing we're a lot of times interested in doing in public health and other research is comparing groups on some sort of summary measure at the respective population level of the groups being compared. We might want to ask, are the population means for something different using continuous data? One possible study design we can use is to do this and subsequent analysis techniques work with what's called a paired design where the subjects in our two groups are inherently linked in some way. One classic example would be before and after data, before and after some sort of intervention or treatment. We take two measurements on each person in the study and compare the means pre and post intervention. Another thing would be if each person in one sample has a twin or other type of sibling in the other sample. So there's an inherent link between persons in the first sample and the second. Third might be a matched case control study where we actually choose a sample of subjects with a condition and for each one of them we find a similar subject who does not have the same condition. So if that condition were some sort of disease we'd have pairs of people. One had the disease, the other did not and they were matched on other characteristics. So for every person in the disease group there was somebody specifically for them in the other group. The other type of comparisons, which we'll get into in Lecture 5, would be where we're comparing two independent samples from two independent populations. For example, if we did a randomized trial and we were comparing one group of patients on treatment A to another on treatment B, and there was no inherent link between anybody in group A and anybody in group B, that would be a situation where we were comparing two independent populations through two independent samples. Or if we took a random sample of persons and then classified them as to their smoking status and wanted to compare smokers to non-smokers and there were no inherent link between those in the smoking group and those in the non-smoking group. That would be another example. But today, we're going to set our focus on the first set, the first type, the paired design. Why is pairing sometimes done in studies? Well, it controls extraneous noise in some sense because each person acts as their control. Ostensibly, for example, in a before-after study, the idea is that the other characteristics that the person whose measurements are be taking before and after some sort of intervention or stress are similar. One of the only variables in that process is the introduction of the intervention or not. These are also good ways to get preliminary data estimates to be used to develop further research. And we'll give some examples of that. So we're going to start with an example to set this up. This is data on 10 non-pregnant premenopausal women between 16 and 49 years old who were beginning a regimen of oral contraceptive use. And these women had their blood pressures measured prior to starting oral contraceptive use and three months after consistent oral contraceptive use. The goal of this small study was to see what, if any, changes in blood pressure were associated with oral contraceptive use in such women, in sort of the population of non-pregnant premenopausal women 16 to 49 years old. So the data on the following slide show the resulting pre- and post-oral contraceptive use systolic blood pressure measurements 
for the ten women in the study. So here is the data in tabular format. And it's just a stacking of ten observations. In the first column, we have the blood pressure measurement before oral contraceptives for each of the ten women. Second column, we have the blood pressure after oral contraceptive use. And then the third column calculates the difference after blood pressure minus before. And then we have the summary statistics below. The mean blood pressure in the ten women prior to oral contraceptive use was about 115.6 millimeters of mercury. Afterwards, it was 120.4 millimeters of mercury, and the difference of the averages, or the average change after minus before, is 4.8 millimeters of mercury. And just something to notice here: the sample average of the differences is 4.8 millimeters of mercury, as I just stated. That actually equals the same thing as if you were to take the mean after. Measurements of 120.4 millimeters of mercury and subtract the mean before measurements of 115.6. So whether you actually take the mean at each time point and subtract them, or take the differences first and then average them, you'll get the same mean change. The sample standard deviations of the differences, however, can only be computed by calculating the differences first. And we'll talk about why that is actually in the next set of lectures. When we get into independent comparisons as well, so you have to hold off for that explanation. But the standard deviation of the difference is once you've created the differences, you just have a single set of ten numbers, and it's computed the same way. We always compute sample standard deviation by taking the difference between each observed difference on each of the ten subjects and the mean overall difference, squaring that, summing that up across all ten subjects, dividing by the sample size of ten less one, and taking the square root of that. In essence, what we have done right out the gate—it's sort of anticlimactic, as I said—we've got this two-sample comparison, and what we have done immediately is reduced the blood pressure information on two samples: the women prior to their OC use and the woman after their oral contraceptive use, into one piece of information. We've collapsed the two samples into one—a sample of differences—and this is actually the standard protocol for comparing paired samples. With a continuous outcome measure. So what we want to do is we want to draw a conclusion about the association of oral contraceptive uses and blood pressure in the population of women who use oral contraceptives. Is the average change in blood pressure zero or not? Is there any association after we've accounted for sampling variability? And sometimes the term expected is used for population average. That's a Technical term, a synonym for mean, is expected value at the population level. So, what we've used mu to represent the population mean, mu is the expected or population mean change in blood pressure. And right off the bat, we've got a sample of differences. We've got a sample mean of the differences. We've got a sample standard deviation. We should be able to go ahead and create a confidence interval for the true mean difference. So here, here's just like we did in the last section. We've reduced this thing to a single sample of differences, and we're going to go ahead and create a 95% confidence interval for the mean change in blood pressure in the population of women taking oral contraceptives after starting OC use compared to prior or before OC use. And what we do, we've got a sample size 10, so we take our estimate, our best guess from the mean from the sample, x bar of the differences, the sample mean of the differences, and we add and subtract a little more than two standard errors because we have a smaller sample. And where would we go to look up the number we needed? Well, that table I gave you in the last set of lectures or online. It turns out we go to t distribution with nine degrees of freedom. And we'd want the amount of, that cuts off 95% in the middle of such a distribution. It's about 2.26. So our confidence interval estimate based on this data would be the sample mean of 4.8 plus or minus 2.26 estimated standard errors, and that gives a confidence interval for the true mean change after minus before in all such women of 1.5 millimeters of mercury to 8.1. So in essence. All the values in this confidence interval represent positive possibilities for the mean change after minus before. And if we wanted to do this instead, of course, we could go ahead and use the CII command. And what we do is give our results here: CII, and then our sample size is 10, our sample mean of 4.8, and our sample standard deviation of 4.6. And you can see we get the same 
result here. Now, something to think about. We've only looked at a sample of size 10. Our confidence interval is wide because of the uncertainty in such a small sample. But notice that the number zero is not in the confidence interval. All of the possibilities for the true mean change after minus before, or even after accounting for sampling variability, are positive. Because zero is not in the interval, this suggests that there is a non-zero change in blood pressure over time, or at least a non-zero association between blood pressure and oral contraceptives in this population. The phrase statistically significant change is sometimes used to indicate a non-zero mean change. In other words, if the confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval does not include zero, we might say the change is statistically significant. And we'll come back to that term in the next section. Just something to think about before we explore this further. Just because there's some evidence of an association at the population level, there's nothing about this study that proves that that is because of oral contraceptive use. And this is one of the difficulties in making strong, substantive conclusions from such a study. The blood pressure change could be due to factors other than oral contraceptives. Even though each woman was her own control, this was done out over a three-month period. Changes in weather over the pre- and post-period could have an impact. Changes in the personal stress levels of the woman. Other things that were temporal or seasonal could affect it. So what we'd really want to do to do a more rigorous study would compare this group to a control group of comparable women who were not taking oral contraceptives. That would strengthen the study, and then we'd be into the realm of comparing two independent groups, which we'll again get to in Lecture 5. But nevertheless, this type of study is done in the absence of any other information, ostensibly at least to generate some evidence of a possible association. And this example here does generate some evidence. After accounting for sampling variability in such a small sample, there's some evidence of a positive association between blood pressure use and oral contraceptives. This may be the catalyst that gets a more rigorous, larger, and more scientifically sound study done. In the next section, we'll keep going with this idea of looking at what happens in our sample and extrapolating to the population, but we're going to take a different approach that's complementary to the confidence interval approach and goes hand in hand with it.